be dumbfounded. They won't know what happened to her, amen. And also, Pastor um, Paul, amen. He's the guy who upholstered these chairs for us. His father-in-law, amen, has has uh, uh, a, a major medical need that he really needs help, amen. So I want to pray that God brings complete healing upon him, amen. You know, intercession works, amen. When you pray for someone else, it works. It absolutely works. I have been witness to it, amen. People in our church have been witness to it. It works. So keep these in your prayers, amen. And you know what? Pray for one another, amen. We link hearts together, and we pray for one another, and we capture the vision of each other, amen. There's no stopping and doing or telling what God can do with us, amen. So you know what? This morning, amen, you can trust in God. Let's cry out to God, amen. Trust in God this morning. Allow God, amen, to meet your needs. Allow God to touch your life, amen. Allow yourself, amen, to be used by God. So let's cry out to God, amen, this uh, this morning as we open up in prayer, amen. So let's worship God. spoken the unspoken God we pray God for healing God we pray God for salvation God we pray God God that you would just change our hearts change our minds God that we'd be more focused God upon your will for our lives God we thank you Lord in Jesus name we pray amen amen you take time to greet some of this this morning <laughs> some announcements. Amen. We got some announcements. Amen. Um, I just want to remind you, amen, uh, for regular services every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. every Wednesday at 7. Amen. Um, also, next Saturday, amen, next Saturday, we will be in the Riverside Church at 11 a.m. Uh, we're going to go out there. We're going to go and Pass out flyers at 11. We're going to go do a Jesus march. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to meet at the church in Riverside at the address on the screen. Um, it's by, it's in the Arlanza area. Um, that's how you say it. Arlanza, Arlanza. It's over there. <laughs> Not down there. But it's over there. Um, anyways, we're going to go over there and what's going to happen is uh, if you guys, if you guys did tend to make signs, just, you know, Paper signs is, you know, Jesus loves you, you know, you know, or whatever, you know, we'll give you ideas. And uh, we're going to go down there and do a march, walk down the street, main streets. Um, I'm going to bring my speaker. Hopefully, I'll have my voice back by then. And we'll do some street preaching. And we'll be out there for like an hour or so, and we'll come back. Uh, and it, it shouldn't take too long. I have a quick meeting with the pastors after that, and then I'm going to go and dedicate the next week to my son and his, and his wife, amen. Because we're doing renovations, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, uh, also, next Sunday night, next Sunday evening is our Sunday night fight. And we're going to have a drama. We're going to have a, a small play. Amen. Testimonies. Amen. On Sunday night. Amen. I told you guys we're going to do things a little bit different. I'm not preaching on Sunday nights. Amen. I, I, I'm, I'm giving you guys the break from that. But we're doing exciting things on Sunday evenings. Amen. We've had some prayer meetings. We've had some fellowships. We've had some good guest preachers. Um, once we get past the rally, I'm going to start scheduling more guest preachers to come in on our Sunday evenings. Uh, it's an exciting time, amen. So you know what? Uh, uh, 
next Sunday night, invite someone. Six o'clock, amen. We're going to have a small play uh, here at the church, amen. The Rialto Church is going to put it on for us. And the visiting churches are going to come and join us, amen. So um, make yourself available next uh, next Sunday, amen. So these are these are all the announcements, amen. And uh, we're going to lift up an offering, amen. So uh, let's worship God. You know, this evening, I mean, this morning, amen, you give with an open heart, amen. You know, we went to, we went to Mexico yesterday, and, and, and I remember in conference, one of the pastors says, Tijuana's not Mexico. And then I went further in Mexico, Tijuana's not Mexico. Tijuana's Mexico, amen. I, uh, we went yesterday, and I can prove it to you, it's Mexico. Um, it's really, it's really, uh, really good to be there, man. And the thing is, is how is that related to our offering? You know, when you go down there, you, you, you don't, you don't realize how good we have it until you go down there, amen. And you see the sacrifices that the people are making, amen. They have a building, man, that they're working on. There. It's, it's rugged, man. They're, they're doing works. Part of the flooring is still great. And they made, they made tamales for us yesterday. My Lord, man, these were good. They made some good tamales. And they had a giant olla outside, in the middle, in the back of the church, inside the building. For, with, and they were cooking it with, with wood, wood fire. They were making it all old school style, man. And it, it's, it's what they have, so they use what they have. Amen. And, and I say that to say this, amen. We're, we're blessed. We're blessed. You know what? You give with an open heart. You know what? Trust in God and bring your tithe. The Bible says that that our tithe, a tithe belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. If you want God to bless your finances, do you realize that you cannot ask God to bless your finances in prayer with confidence unless you are giving? Unless you're tithing, it's not it's not according to Pastor Ben. It's according to the Word of God. You got you got it because the Bible says that when in the Book of Malachi, when we don't pay our tithes, that we're cursed. And it's not, it is, not only does it say we're cursed, Malachi says we're cursed with a curse. We're double cursed. But when we're, but when, when, we, when, we, when we're open and we, and we bring a man what belongs to God, the Bible says that we're blessed, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That we will not have room enough to receive it. I don't know about you, but I want that blessing, amen. And I see that blessing in my life. I see that in my, in my children's life. And it's because God is always faithful. Amen. So you give with an open heart, um, trust in God, bring your tithe, give an offering, and support missions, amen, as we continue to take the kingdom, amen. So let's bow our hearts as brother angel, bless the gift from Father God, we ask that you bless these tithes and offerings that we brought before you this morning, God. Bless the gift that you brought before us, Father God. Bless those that continue to be faithful in your kingdom, Father God. Bless those that are sowing seed this morning, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, running at the door. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, running at the door. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. If you're wondering why we did a short song service, it's because. Uh, immediately after service, I'm taking off and going to San Fernando to go uh, preach at the San Fernando Church, you know. And I don't want to cut your time in the way that. Um, so I cut the sunset a little short so we can have the appropriate time for God's message. Um, <coughs> today I want to talk about having more of God in your life. I want to ask you something. I want to ask you something. When was the last time that you cried out to God? I want you to think about this, this question. When was the last time you cried out to God? Because if, if we're honest, amen, the last time we cried out to God, we cried out to God for, for what we all cried out to God for. God, I need you to move in this for me, God. God, I need your hand upon their life, God. 
God, can you bless me, God? God, the sickness, God, can you remove it? God, at work, can you can you can you help me, God? And, and, and these are the things that we naturally pray for, and these are these are good things. But I'm going to ask you something that's an important that's an important question: is when was the last time? That you cried out to God for more God in your life. See, we live in a we live in a time where everything is everything is included. Everything is everybody is to make made to to feel good. You're okay to think that way. You're okay to feel that way. Don't tell them that they're thinking wrong. And by doing that, we've allowed a man's society to begin to have a mentality that what I think is correct. And it's not always correct. But what we do is we take that and we, and, and we impart that into the church. When we say, God, I need this. I need that. Now, we do need to bring our needs to God. We do. That, it's biblical. It's what we need to do. The Bible tells us to do, right? We need to bring our needs. But what I'm talking about today is when was the last time we said, God, no more of me. I need all of you. Because this is what's important. When was the last time we said, God, teach me to surrender. Teach me to put down my life, God. God, teach me how to be beside myself that I can be more like you, God. You see, Jesus Christ, when he came to the earth, he didn't come to the earth just so he could die on the cross. Although this was the final sacrifice and this was important, this is how we regain our salvation as he gets resurrected. However, he came to this earth and he lived amongst us. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. He came to show us that we can live for Him. We can surrender to Him. Whenever Jesus had time, a uh, spare time, did we did we do we read in the Bible how He was laying out at the beach? No. Do we read about how how Jesus took time and, and, and went on vacation? No. What we hear about is how when Jesus had spare time, He went to the sick and, and, and met their needs. How we hear about how when Jesus had spare time, he went to the synagogues to go teach more people about who he is. So when it comes to us, when was the last time we said, God, I have too much of me in my life. Everything that I want to do, I'm already doing. Everything that I, I need, God, you have provided for me. Everything that I desire, God, that you know belongs in my life, you have given me. God, it is now time for me to put down who I am to serve you. Yeah. When was the last time we said, God, I'm going to lay down my life for you? What is it? There's no greater love than what? What does Jesus say? Then for, 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 for a man to lay down his life for his friend. Do we think that that, that, that statement comes from the mouth of Jesus Christ to, to, just, to just reference the cross? And what he did for the final sacrifice? Or do we realize that, you know what, these are instructions from the mouth of God saying that we need to lay down our life for him too. Because he's already laid his life down for us. When have we laid down our lives? We're talking to the pastors in, in, in Mexico yesterday. And 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 I tell them, I say, you know, and, and Martha's telling them, I say, you, you know, people think that we come down here for vacation. That we're down there on vacation all the time. Oh, Pastor Ben, Sister Martha, oh, they have so much fun. They're on vacation. They're in all the pictures and all the churches in Mexico. They're there. They're on vacation. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of sacrifice. It's a lot of, I'm telling I, I, I will never preach something that I don't live. I can't tell you about the things I haven't done. I can only tell you about the things I have done. I can't, I can't. I can't give you proper instruction off of a book that I read by someone else who wrote it if I haven't lived it. I can only tell you the things that I've lived, and I tell you I've laid down my life and says, God, you know what? I put you first. You make sacrifices with God. So when was the last time we cried out to God and said, God, uh, I need more of you and less of me? 
Because I'm not talking about a about a prayer where we tell God about all the things that we need. It's far too often this is the Christian's prayer life. Think about the last time that, that you got on your knees and you began to pray. What did you talk to God about? Because chances are we didn't ask God how his day was. We told him the bad things about ours. And this is our nature. This is who we are. This is who we are. And I'm not saying this, that, that we're doing things wrong because the Bible tells us to bring our needs to God. But what I'm saying is that, that there's more to it. Because if you get married, amen, and you expect your spouse to only do for you and you never do for them, you're never going to have a successful marriage. It goes both ways. Aren't we the bride of Christ? Aren't we married to God? Or, or, or aren't we connected to the throne of Christ? So we do need to bring our needs. Jesus even said it in Luke chapter 11, verse 9 to 10. The words of Christ say this. It says, so I, so, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Paul tells the, the church of Philippi in, in Philippians 4.19. He says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So I'm not saying we don't bring our needs to God. We need to bring our needs to God. This is important. You, you, you need God in your home. You need God in your finances. You need God at your job. So you need to bring these needs to God. You do need to bring these needs to God. But what I'm saying is that can't be all that we do with God. What was the last time you said, God, what do you want me to do I've had that prayer many times in my life. I said, God, what do you want me to do? And he says, I need you to learn a new language because I'm going to use your life in another country. So what do I do? I begin to learn a new language, I begin to make friends with people who I can't understand. Where now we can begin to communicate, talk, and laugh. Amen. You see, what was the last time we said, God, I need more of you in my life? When was the last time we said, God, what can I do for you? Or God, what is your will in my life? If you sit with me, I, can, I, I, I begin to speak life. And then God's going to use your life. You're called to be a preacher. Man, God's going to make you real fruitful. Hey, why don't you become an usher? You, you're going to be a Bible study leader. God wants to use your music ministry. God's going to use your life. And people think all they want to do is fill positions, and that's not what it is. I'm speaking life because you know what? God God shares and he says, you know what, Ben? Uh, uh, we're going to fill your church, and we're going to we're going to we're going to have all the functions that need to be done so that people can come and call it a house of praise and a house of worship. But as I begin to speak these things upon people, what happens is is sometimes it gets scary. I'm telling you, the will of God can be scary. Sometimes, as, you know what, God can use your life and what happens, people put up their guard and say, well, oh, hold on, hold on, all I wanted to do was just sit in the service. Don't bug me. How could I? That's not what I do. It's not me. But God's called you to greater things. God's called you to greater things. Didn't he say he used... He uses the abased things to profound the wise, the, sim the simplicity of people. He, he, he brings those with no education to, to bring an education to those with a degree. You know, we sat in conference, I think it was, I think it was this year, and we had the pastor's fellowship. I don't know how it happened. I'm sitting, we're just sitting down here, and then they say, no, come sit over here, and I'll go sit over there. Before you know it, I'm sitting right next to Pastor Lorenzo. And then right next to me is a doctor, it's a pastor doctor, the surgeon. I'm not sure if you guys know this. I'm not a surgeon. I know I look like a surgeon, talk like a surgeon. I'm not a surgeon. I do not have a college education. 
I've shared with you the last grade I tried to pass was eighth grade. I didn't even get to do my eighth grade graduation walk. Amen. They kicked me out of school for being me. Don't have an education at all. I do got a GED. So there I am, amen, sitting next to the leader of the whole fellowship, amen, which is my pastor, my friend, and then a doctor. And I'm sitting there, they tell me I was sitting at the, at the king's table, amen, so I'm sitting there, and everybody makes fun of me over there. They think, I'm, they think I get special attention, but really, that's another story. And I'm sitting there conversing with the doctor, having an educated conversation with him, speaking about the life of God, in God's role in healing and in medicine. I never could have did that 30 years ago. Now, I might say not smarter than him, but no way, by no, by no means. But the God I serve puts me in places that you don't belong to. And qualifies you for the things that this world has disqualified you. Because I guarantee you, this, this doctor in his practice of medicine, if he knew who I was 30 years ago, wouldn't have spent time to talk to a person like me. You see, God wants to do things in your life. When was the last time we said, God, use my life? Less of me, Lord, and more of you. See, Solomon, King Solomon, he built a temple. He built a house, a house of worship for God. And then the temple, when you get into history, it's a very important thing. Jerusalem becoming, amen, the capital of Israel, amen, in today's time, amen, falls back, amen, even to the time of Solomon and King David. But, the, but, but the Solomon, he builds the temple. And he dedicates the temple unto God. Solomon cried out to God, asking for him to dwell in the temple. Now listen. To dwell means for him to live in there. To be there. He wants God to dwell. This is what Solomon's crying out to for this new temple that he created. Amen. For that the children of Israel could come and have a place of worship. Because he wanted this, he wanted the temple to be filled with the presence of God. Last I seen on the Bible, it says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the God's temple. During COVID, everybody says uh, the church is the church is at the building. We are the church, the people. Well, then be the church, be the temple. Amen. According to the Word of God, Solomon created, uh, built a temple, and asked God to dwell in the temple. He wanted a place, Amen. He wanted the temple to be a place that Israel, God's chosen people, could come and be in the presence of God and find refuge. So as, as Solomon built this temple and he cries out to God, come upon this temple. Fill this temple that your people can come and worship. Amen. Remember, we are the, we are the temple of God. So in 2 Chronicles 7, 12 to 14, this is what happens. The Bible says that the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, could you imagine the Lord appearing to you. Coming into the, to the omnipresence of God. And this is what's happened in Solomon because he cried out to God. Pleading for more of him in, the, in his life. And this is what he says. He says, I have heard your prayer. And I have chosen this place for myself. As a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven... And there is no rain. Or command the locusts to devour the land. Or send pestilence among my people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. And will forgive their sins and heal their land. See, God answers the prayer. God says He has chosen the temple as a place for Himself. God has chosen the temple for a place for Himself, the Bible says. When Solomon cries out to God, fill this temple. 
so that people can come worship here. Fill this temple that people would know that the presence of God is exi does exist. You realize that you are the temple of God. That when we ask God, more of you in my life, he says, I will make this my place. He didn't say, Solomon, I will visit your temple. He didn't say, Solomon, thank you for the building, and I will come around every, th every other Tuesday. He says, no, I have chosen this place for myself. Out. You are God's temple. He has chosen you for Himself. He did not choose you for a Tuesday evening. He did not choose you for a Wednesday evening. He has chosen you for His self. To dwell. To be a part of. To rest in. And to not leave. My, my Bible says that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And this is who God is. This is what God tells Solomon. But what's interesting in our text is that immediately after he says that he is going to, 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 to dwell upon this place and that he has called the temple of Solomon his own, that it is mine for me, myself, for me only. He says these words and immediately calls it a place of sacrifice. The temple of God is a place of sacrifice. So let's think about that for a moment. A place of sacrifice. What is a place of sacrifice? What's a place of sacrifice? God said that he chose the temple that was built by Solomon to be a place that he would dwell in and be there. See, this is a place that God is saying that he will live in. This is a place that when Israel needed him, they would find him. You realize that you were a place that God has said, I'm going to dwell in? Because there's people in your life that are going to need to look for God, and guess where they're going to find them? In the temple of God that God has created in you? Amen. That they're looking for God and looking through you to find him? you got to understand that. You, you, hold, you hold an important, important role. I remember when I was pastoring in Northern California, I worked at I worked at the at the hospital. I was a file clerk for the extra department. Okay. Think about this, file clerk for the extra department. In this particular hospital, we used to do the um, transport, we used to transport patients down back and forth to to, uh, to the diagnostic imaging and radiology department. And my mom thought it was amazing. Simple minded woman. She just about told everybody I was a doctor because I worked in a hospital. <laughs> Amen? I was talking to a guy from Southern California Edison who deals with these high, big, powerful cables that light up neighborhoods, right? And I was joking with him one day, and it was a long time ago, a time, because you know, they do all that, and they're just kind of sitting, the guys were all sitting there talking. And, you know, and they only deal with the big electricity. And I go, I go, hey, does your family tell you that they got a, they bought a ceiling fan and they want you to put it up because you're an electrician? Because they think you're an electrician? And they all started laughing. They go, yeah. They, go, they have no idea what you guys do out here, huh? They go, no. All they know is that they work with electrical. <laughs> so they think that they're going to put a ceiling fans. Meanwhile, they're, they're, they're bringing energy to entire neighborhoods and stores, shopping centers, and hospitals. Hey, man, um, I got a light switch in this new place. Can you come do it? But see, it's, it's the mentality of people that when they see somebody who does something, they, they automatically think they know everything about it. It's a story I shared when I used to coach the kids. They played, they played soccer for the last 10 years, and so you assume that they know? Because if you had a soccer ball in your, at, in your hand or at your feet, then the assumption is you are a soccer player. You understand the rules, and they did it. You are a Christian. You are a child of God. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are God's dwelling place. And if you are God's dwelling place, people are looking at you as God's dwelling place. They're looking for more God, and they're looking for more God in you. That is who we are. That is, that is who God has called us to be. So what is interesting is if we're not careful, 
we can overlook and skip right over a very important part that is that is that in just a few words God lays down the foundation of what he is going to require if Solomon is going to want God to remain in the temple this is what he says God says he has chosen this place as a house of sacrifice so the word sacrifice is defined as this an act of giving up something valued see when you give your life to God we give up the bad stuff right we give up the, 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 the stuff that we know is killing us drinking drugs all that. that's we give that stuff up and as we live for God we say I sacrifice because I gave up that stuff that's not a sacrifice that's not a sacrifice Sacrifice is defined as giving up something valued for the sake of something else, regarded as more important or worthy. What about our lives are we hanging on to that we are not sacrificing? This is why God has told Solomon that if you want my presence, he says, if you want my want to be my people if you want me in your life if you want this temple to remain this must be a place of sacrifice a place that we give up the things that we value but he says if the word if and i always tell you guys the word if is the biggest two-letter word you'll ever read because in the Bible, when you see the word if, it requires an action. It means we got to do something. The word if is not written, amen, in a passive manner to where it just part to complete a sentence. The word if is placed because God is telling us that in order for this to transpire and take place, this has to actually happen. You can't have this unless you do this. God says that, you know what, I want to give you this. I want to do this. But I'm not going to even think about this until you begin to do this. Well, Mom, I want dessert with my dinner. Well, you haven't finished your vegetables. You ain't getting dessert unless you finish your vegetables. I don't like vegetables. I don't like you telling me you don't like it. Still eat your vegetables. You don't eat your vegetables, you don't get, a, you don't get your dessert. But what about when God is telling us that? What about when God's telling us that? I want to move in your life. I want to do something different. But, but every time you come to sit down, you want to leave the vegetables on the plate because you just don't like them. But God's saying it's those vegetables that I'm going to give you the nutrition that's going to, that's going to bring value to your body, that you're going to be able to function, you're going to be able to move, and I'm going to be able to be a part of what you're asking for. This is why he says, yeah. See, because the God that we serve is this jealous God. You know that God doesn't want to share you with anything? You have to understand this. I, I, I was terrified of this scripture early on in my Christianity. I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. I was terrified of it. Remember, I gave my life to God because me and my wife were separated and we're going to get divorced. And my wife and kids were the most valuable thing I've ever transpired in my life and there was no way I wanted to give that up so I surrendered completely to God and when I read this scripture and I found this out it scared the heck out of me because I never wanted to make I never wanted a man to put anything in front of God because I was afraid of what God would do to that if I put my kids in front of God I was afraid of what God was going to do to my kids to remove them from being a hindrance into my walk with God I want you to think about that I put my kids first but they're my kids. God will understand. God loves me. God understands. Those are my kids. He had a kid, didn't he? He had, got a, he had a kid named Jesus. So he understands the heart of a father, the heart of a mother. So I'm going to put my kid first. God says, no, nah, nah. You put your child first, I'll remove your child so that I be first. God wants to remove everything that distracts you from his will. So when I read the scripture, it terrified me because I didn't want to lose the very thing, amen, that brought me to God. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 5, it says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He's jealous, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children. 
But he doesn't do that just to your children. He says, oh, oh, visiting the iniquities of the fathers of the children unto when? The third and unto the fourth generation, the Bible says. And he says, not to those who love me who are distracted and just put me second. He says, to those who hate me. Do you realize that when we don't put God first and make him priority in our life, the Bible tells us that God says that we hate him. That's how he sees us. He sees us as, as, as that we look at God and we have a disdain for God. We don't like God. We despise God. Because of you, God, I can't do that. And the Bible says that he's a jealous God. He wants us first. He doesn't want to share us with nobody. So this is simple. God wants all of you. He doesn't want you to be distracted by anything. He wants to be first. He wants to be your number one priority. You see, we understand what jealousy is when it comes to a relationship. But sometimes we have a hard time translating it when it comes to our walk with God. So I'm going to keep it simple. God just wants your attention with no distractions. That's it. He wants your attention with no distractions. That means no excuses. That means no excuses. So I have the same question. When was the last time you cried out to God for more of Him in your life? When we, when we are consumed with our needs, wants, desires, problems, stress, sicknesses, we're not giving God our full attention. Oh, the sicknesses, Pastor, what am I going to do? When, we're, when we consume ourselves with these, these, with these things, with our wants and desires and problems and stress and sicknesses. We're distracted. But how am I going to make it? I got these things. But how am I going to do it? I, don't you understand? I can't go. I have no money. I can't do this. I have no time. But you understand the person that I live with. God, if we do that, we're not giving God our full attention. This is why after God's after God tells Solomon that, that he has chosen the temple as the house of sacrifice, God tells Solomon in verse 14, Chronicles 7, 14, it says, 7 Chronicles 7, 14, it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, because then I can hear them. Once they remove the distractions and put me first, once they get everything out of their lives and say, you know what, I'm no longer going to focus on these things. Uh, he says, then I will hear them from heaven uh, and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. You know that, 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 that your problems, your desires, your, your, your stress, your sicknesses, that's your land. You understand that? That's your land. That's who you are. That's your, that's, who, that's your property. These are the things that the Bible says that God tells Solomon. He says, when we surrender, we humble ourselves, we seek the face of God. He says, I'll heal their land. The very thing that's holding you back, the very thing that's distracting, the very thing that we say we can't do because of. He says, God says, relax, man. I want to pray. Just seek me first. Look for my face first. God tells Solomon, just tell Solomon, put me first and I'll take care of the rest. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34, he says, Therefore I say unto you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What will you put on is not life more than food or the body more than clothing? Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value of more value than they? Aren't you more valuable than a bird? He says, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to a statue? Verse 28. 
And here's Jesus saying, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet, I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Or owe oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. We're the Gentiles. Those are not those are things we look to us. For your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Don't you think God knows what you need? How can I afford the car that I need to get to the church that I gotta go to? How can I afford the house that I'm gonna live in? How can I how can my marriage ever get better? How can how can my job ever, ever, ever fall into place? He says, don't you think, he says, for your Heavenly Father knows that you're all, you, all the things that you need. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Why do we allow things to distract us from the things of God? Hey, you know, we're gonna, can you, nope. Why, well, because. You know. And it's in all things of God. It's hard to get people to come to church early to open up, to get the air conditioner on. Because we got so many things that are in our lives. And we get anxious about everything. And, and how could I? But you don't understand. And, and this is what happens. This is what transpires in us. But in Philippians, Paul says, as he writes to the church of Philippi in 4, 6, and 7, Paul says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds through Christ Jesus. Remember, Jesus said in, in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things shall be added. And this is the words of Jesus. Philippians 4, 13. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Remember, it's not you. Then the Bible says, unless the Lord goes before us, those who labor, labor in vain. Everything you do is going to be in vain unless we put God first. Right. Psalms 5.22 in the New King James Version says, Cast your burdens on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Cast it all upon God. Don't worry about it. Leave it alone. God, I, I, that's why we pray, God, I give you this, God, I need this, I need that, I need this. Okay, God, boom, done. But yet we want to fix them. No, it says, cast your needs upon God. Cast your burdens upon God. And then walk away from them. Stop carrying them. It's like we, 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 we bring our needs to the altar of Christ. And as we get up, we, we open up our backpack and throw them all back into our backpack. Okay, God, I got them right here for when you need them. You think God needs to know where they're at? God knows where they're at. But we want to hang on to them so we can keep them together. Thinking God is going to have a hard time finding them. No, God knows where they're at. He's just waiting for you to let them go. And start serving them. When you let them go, you can begin to move in the things of God. And God can begin to move in your life and change things. And let the temple of God become the dwelling place. In the same scripture, 5, Psalms 5.22... The New Living Translation says, and he will not permit the godly to slip and fall. If you cast them upon God, you know, the, the Bible talks about casting. It's casting, throwing, right? 
In baseball, they cast, they throw a ball. Everybody catches it. Right? Right? He don't throw it to himself. He throws it to someone else. Right? He casts it, he throws it away. He says, cast, throw it away. Right? You catch, you throw it away. He didn't say reel it in. He says, cast, throw it away. Cast your burdens, throw it away. Stop trying to fix them, throw it away. God, I give you a good one. And let God, let God do what God does. You know? I'd like to read about a red closed in that just for a few moments. And we're about to get closed just for a few moments, amen. As we take time, amen. This morning, amen, you're here and, and God spoke to you. You know, God wants all of you. He doesn't want part of you. And every time we hang on to these things, amen, what we're doing is we're not allowing God his fullness in our life. God tells Solomon, amen, that he wants to make this temple his dwelling place. He wants to live there. He wants to stay there because he loved the temple so much. It was a beautiful temple. He wanted to be there. And then he tells Solomon, he goes, and you know what? This is what I'll do. But first, tell the people who are called by my name to humble themselves and seek my face. This way I can dwell there. God wants to dwell in your life. He wants to be where you're at. He wants you to feel his presence. But he's saying we need to humble ourselves and seek his face first. So this morning when God spoke to you, we're going to open up the altar. Why don't you come find a place to pray? And allow God to use your life that God, I give you my burdens. I give you my cares. And God, I'm no longer going to put them in my backpack. God, I'm going to leave them at the altar. I will not pick them up because they now belong to you. you. Begin to cry and say, God, I need more of you in my life. Live by me, 